Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Filippo Guarini. I'm the director of the Textile Museum. We are going to present our um, online workshop uh, about sustainability of textile heritage know-how. Uh, this workshop is organized uh, uh, together with the University of Evora and Passau of Futuro Association in Portugal. I would like to thank uh, uh, all the other partners of uh, the Creative Wear project, as well as also the associated partners, Francesco Bolli, from our staff, the TCBL network, uh, and all the other projects that are helping us in promoting this event. The event is live streamed uh, through uh, the social media uh, challenge uh, channels of uh, four different institutions. So welcome to the attendees and welcome to the speakers. Uh, the workshop is organized in the framework, as I was saying, of a Creative Wear Plus project. It's a project financed by the Interreg Med program. Uh, very few words about the Creative Wear and Creative Wear Plus projects. Creative Wear, fun, um, it was a project that was funded by the Interreg Med program between uh, 2016 and 2019. And it was a project addressed to, br to bring new attention to creativity, personalized design, uh, artisan and small scale productions, and also territorial, uh, territorially specific value chains for the textile and clothing sector of uh, the area. Uh, within the project, five creative hubs uh, uh, brought, brought together artists, designers, creatives, with uh, textile and clothes businesses and communities in several countries, such as Italy, Spain, Slovenia, and Greece. Within the project, different experimentations uh, led to a common creative wear model, whose transfer capacity was also uh, tested by uh, extension to uh, seven new creative hubs through an open call launched in 2018. And then by uh, an incorporation of the model into the Horizon 2020 TCBL uh, Network and Innovation Lab in 2019. Um, Within the project, uh, the five hubs uh, uh, focused on uh, the experimentation of different topics and models, such as the heritage as, as a source of innovation and inspiration, social added value, uh, new materials and processes, synergies among artists and businesses, crowdsourcing platforms for matchmaking among creatives and companies. In 2021 and 2022, the Creative Wear Plus project associates three original partners from Italy and Greece with three new hubs, which has been established in Portugal, France, and Bosnia Herzegovina, with the aim to further integrate the Creative Wear network by um, directing, let's say, creativity towards new challenges of circular economy and sustainability of the sector. So the, the, the aim of today's workshop is uh, to give visibility to the collaboration that is uh, taking place uh, uh, throughout the project between the Evora University and the Textile Museum of Prato on the theme of the announcement of the European Textile Heritage uh, intended as a source of contemporary inspiration. We will do it by presenting some selected uh, interesting ex experiences based in Tuscany and in the Halentejo region that mix uh, creativity, knowledge, transmission, and sustainable craft tradition for the contemporary global and local market. The workshop is structured around two panels. The first one, um, it will be open and coordinated by Lotto Zero, uh, based in Prato, in Tuscany, and the second one by Passau Futuro Association, based in uh, uh, Evora, in Alentejo. 
And during and after the presentation, attendees can pose uh, questions by posting messages through the social media channels in which the conference is uh, live streamed. So thank you for your attention. Now I leave immediately the floor to Arianna Moroder from uh, Lotto Zero, uh, and she's introducing the first pal panel. Thank you very much. Arianna, we are not hearing you. I think you have to un unmute the microphone. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let's I'm start sorry. again. <laughs> so, okay. hello everybody. I'm Arianna Moroder from Lotto Zero Textile Laboratories in Prato. And I was, I was thanking you, Filippo, for the introduction and, uh, and thanks in general for this uh, lovely online event. These, of course, are themes that we work with on a daily basis. Um, we are a center for textile design, art and textile culture um, in, in general at 360 degrees. We are based here in the textile district of Prato. Um, and crafts, for sure, are, are a huge part of, of uh, what we work with, what we do. Um, I will share with you the presentation if I can. Okay, here we are. So this is us, Lotto Zero. Uh, this is our mission statement. Oh, it's in Italian, yes. <laughs> it's to create a fertile environment for research and experimentation in the textile sector and to promote and facilitate the exchange between uh, designers and artists on an international level and companies in the district of Prato. Of course, this means um, that we are a place where many uh, different figures connect and artisans and makers are a tremendous uh, part of this. This is our space uh, in Prato. This is our team. Uh, it's the four of us. Uh, we are also a co-working studio where a lot of designers, makers and artisans share workspace. Uh, this is our space. You can see it's a very wide space. There's a lot of uh, airiness to do a lot of things, which, uh, of course, artisans and makers and craftspeople can appreciate. And this is our workshop. So this is where things uh, actually get done. You can get a little glimpse of our loom and our yarns and all the materials that are used in our workshop. We are an exhibition space where we show uh, contemporary art that uses textile materials. And we are also an event space uh, where we hold events uh, just like this one would be um, or, or many other events where we exchange and uh, we do matchmaking and we have people uh, get in touch and, and get in contact with each other. We organize residencies for designers and artists and makers. Uh, we hold workshops and um, so we are really for the for the application for the applied arts for getting a very um, hands-on approach uh, to our to our techniques and, and entering um, the, the world of textiles through the world uh, of crafts. Um, we teach, so this is something that we that we promote throughout our work and we promote it to to the young generations, to students in a variety of schools. And we are part of a wide-reaching uh, network of international schools, textile labs, and museum and exhibition spaces. These are a few examples. So we are also a studio, and uh, we provide consultancies. Um, we design textiles. We consult brands. We consult companies. Um, our knowledge is complemented with the great experience of the textile district. So um, the type of services that we provide can connect a brand or a designer 
to a manufacturer, but also to an artisan, to a craftsperson, to someone who will uh, help them realize um, and, and, and make their projects happen. We also do trend research and we work as a design studio and agency. Um, we do textile developments and this can be both on an industrial level, but also on a more uh, craft-based artisanal level. We work with a lot of hand weavers and hand knitters, uh, embroiders and so on and so on. So uh, we're very lucky to have this huge network. We also do a lot of work around uh, archive materials. So we collaborate with the textile museum and with the companies that we have around us, uh, which all have uh, a historic archive of their work as well. And yes, this is, this is a little bit of a, a glimpse into, into our world and into what we do. We're definitely very interested in the discussion around, um, around craft and around the future of craft and how craft keeps developing. This is a subject that is um, at the moment more than ever uh, it's worth exploring and it's worth uh, discussing. So I'm very grateful again for our talk today. So without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, which is a lovely uh, friend of ours and also part of her network. Uh, she is a craft person. She's a designer. She's uh, somewhat of an inventor. Uh, she's an entrepreneur and uh, the founder um, of her business, which uh, is appropriately called Crafts. Uh, her name is Elif, uh, Elif Markoslav, and I would like to um, say hi, Elif. Thank you for being here. Hi, Ariana. Thank I'm you for inviting me. To see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, your work is is really inspirational, and I always um, I always mention you, especially when I I meet students who have. Um, who have like a, a special talent for, for making things, for, for creating things uh, with their hands. Because in this uh, translation between our ideas and what our hands can do, so many things happen. And I always have to think about you when I think about that. Thank you. <laughs> so please um, introduce yourself and okay. let everyone know the wonderful things uh, that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Elif Malkoçlar. I am Turkish, but I do live and work in Florence since 30 years. I'll do a quick presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain, uh, but then I'll show you some examples because I think it's better to uh, make you understand what I really do. I basically study all handmade techniques from all over the world. But of course, I start from my own culture, which is Turkish. And, and somehow uh, I try to transform uh, these craft techniques into different things. Uh, I've been, I founded my company in 2004. Uh, we do collaborate with many brands, especially in fashion. Uh, we do work also with designers and architects. And in these years, I built up a huge archive. Currently, we have almost 7,000 pieces in our archive. And it took us a, a, long a long time to build it because we had to photograph everything and make a, a coding system uh, and then we divided it by technique and the material we use. So um, we also study uh, the material. So I combine the two things together, the craft technique plus the material. So uh, mostly the result is very interesting. And uh, there becomes a very long journey because it never ends. Uh, once you find out something that works, immediately I have some another thing in my mind to try. I would like to show you some images because I think it helps us. These are the companies we work together. We work uh, almost with everyone. 
we do also hot couture. This back in UC, this was my first work. It was very interesting. I did these bags for Isangaran. This is a Kavali show. Uh, usually we make show pieces because uh, the pieces we do, it takes really so long time. So after the show, some of them we do the production. This was still the Kavali show. Just to give you an idea, the dress on the left, it's all crochet, but we mix uh, leather yarn, um, cotton yarn, different kind of yarns together. It's something like this take us like days to do it. And this was a collaboration with Alexander McQueen. The dress uh, is hand knitted, uh, the black one. It's a very thin mohair and there are no, um, it's seamless and it takes us like two months to do it. So you cannot do a production. <laughs> We usually do these pieces. This is again a McQueen piece, still McQueen. We do collaborate with Chanel. And you can maybe see in all of these products, there's a, a, a very long research. We usually work with the designers. They come here in our studio, see uh, our archive. And then anything they found in the archive, it can become any something else. Like they, we have like these swatches. I show you now. This is a bag for Armani. And then we work on it and we try to transform it uh, in what they want. We also change the materials. These are the pieces we did for Dior. These are all macrame. So we use any kind of handmade techniques, macrame, crochet, knitting, embroidery. This was a Fendi bag. We do also collaborate with Salvatore Ferragamo. You know, they have a very nice museum here in Florence. And every, day, every year they pick up a few uh, examples from the museum. And uh, they do like uh, collection pieces and uh, they are like 200 pieces. I did this one and the shoes cannot uh, be taken away from the museum because there are huge, um, uh, I don't know how to say this one. Anyway, you have to produce it exactly as they are in the museum. So it's so difficult because uh, they're almost 50 years old. So the color change, everything is changed, but you have to redo it as they are in the museum. This, uh, these are also the shows we did with Dior and Bottega Veneta. This was one of the latest uh, Dior show. I did so many uh, Fendi icon back. This is a baguette, as you know. Here on this piece, I studied this technique. It's crochet, we put the paillettes on. It's a very small bag, maybe probably you know it. And it uh, there are like um, 5,000 paillettes on it. And it's not an embroidery. We crochet all the paillette one by one. So you can imagine how long it takes to do on the one bag. This is Yves Saint Laurent. This is macrame. I, this is Balenciaga. Uh, this was a huge tubular, leather tubular. So you cannot knit it as a normal yarn. We have to, we had to knit it without using anything, only by hands. This is a Prada crochet raffia bag. This is a Burberry shoe, I think. I go quickly because there are, in, this is Salvatore Ferragamo again. Ah, this was very nice. This is macrame. The, um, we uh, this, did this upper, it was another color, and then they mold the shoe and then put dye it afterwards. So that's why you see it's not all uh, the same everywhere because the color changes. This is Dolce Gabbana again. We did the skirt. 
Uh, on the right, you see it while we are uh, working on it uh, because we didn't want to use a fabric because otherwise it wouldn't be seamless. And then uh, we had to do this kind of circular loom. Uh, and then we did it uh, like this on um, without a loom. I did also with Maria Grazia Curie, with Dior, uh, Chiara Ferrani's wedding dress. It was uh, a lace, handmade lace, a crochet. It took us like 500 hours to do it. This was the dress. And here is Adele with our Chanel cape. It's also macrame as well. And this is our last project. Uh, I would like to talk more about this. Uh, these are uh, Valentino sneakers. It's kind of loom and crochet mix. It took us uh, like more than three months to build this one because uh, it's very new. No one did something like this before. Um, but there are lots of problems. Uh, before arriving this point, you should, uh, we tried it, I don't know how many times. Uh, I had to, uh, these are the publicity, yes. I had to design this kind of loom because in the shoe, uh, uh, there is so little difference with, with the, uh, by the sizes. It's only seven millimeters. And as you can imagine, in a handmade thing, seven millimeters is nothing. But we had to be sure that every, each size uh, was uh, exactly that size, so it was so difficult. And this is the result. And we also collaborate with architects and designers. This is uh, this one we did for the architects who designed Alexander McQueen uh, shops. Uh, every year, Wallpaper Magazine. Uh, they choose few uh, architects and they ask them to, to realize something handmade. So we, they designed this and we, we did it crochet again. This is Irish crochet. And all the flowers on it are three dimensional. Here we are molding it. These are the swatches I was talking about. Uh, we have like 7,000 7, of these swatches uh, made by any kind of materials. This is leather, macrame. This is leather as well. So this is a lamp uh, we did with Patricia Urquiola. Uh, we macrame these beads on these huge lands. They were three meters high, and we did three of them for a villa in uh, Maldives. We had to use about 30,000 beads. So uh, it took us ages to do it because you, as you see the yarn, it was so long and each bead had to be <laughs> put through this yarn. Oops. Uh, the structure was like two parts. We did first the inner part, and then we used the uh, yarn uh, to do the outer circle. You will see it now. I couldn't. And these were the smaller ones we did again for this villa. And this one, this was the. <laughs> Yeah, it was amazing. It was also so difficult to send them to Maldives because they were shipped. Uh, uh, we have to build also the boxes that were used uh, to ship them. Oops. These are the bedrooms. We also did the, this part in leather. And that's it. I hope I could give the idea of, of what we are doing because it can really change. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. And I would like to say to everyone, we are open to 
any kind of collaboration. If ever anyone wants to do something creative with us, everyone is welcome. That's really wonderful, Elif. Thank you so much for showing us your amazing work. Um, I loved what you said about uh, how the material and the technique, uh, they, they inform each other and they keep like, changing each other so that it is, your work is both material and technique led and this constant exchange between what you can make a material do is a, um, seems to be like your driver that it keeps you finding new solutions finding new ways of, of approaching maybe the techniques that are very old even or traditional and you just find a way to to really transform them yes a key to transform them something contemporary wonderful and um, so I was also curious to ask you about the collaboration with the fashion designers, how that um, evolves, how, how that works, um, is uh, how the exchange works between you and, uh, and the designer from a, a fashion design team. Um, yeah, just how the dialogue works, how you... Uh, mm -hmm. maybe pa pass on ideas and inspirations, how, how you collaborate? They usually come up with an idea because every fashion show has a, has a team. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, of course, they, they have an idea, but they don't know how to realize it. So this is my job. And I show you first, I show them first the archive and the possibilities that we can do. And uh, sometimes, and it uh, this it has to be a product then. So it's not something really crafty or an art piece. So this is the difference. It must be a product and you have to sell it somehow uh, and you have to produce it. This is the most difficult part. I mean, if you do when in Alta Moda only one piece, that's okay. But the sneakers I show you first, we produced 30,000 pairs. <laughs> and it, took, uh, took, uh, it takes us 10 hours to do one pair. Wow. So you can imagine. So you have to be careful. <laughs> I mean, uh, sometimes when you do the show pieces, it's okay because it's only one. And then you have to go to, into the production. And you know, in fashion business, there's no time. I mean, the time is the main thing because you have to produce it. Even you sell one or 10,000, the time of production is the same. So uh, the collaboration is more uh, not on creativity, but uh, finding solutions of how to produce it or mm -hmm. how you can make them producible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is a that is actual one actually a main uh, design challenge, right? That, that it comes is. in. Yes, it is. So you are really at the at the crossroads between craft and design, of course. Great, amazing. So okay. I I would love to to move on to Eva and then maybe um, ask you both like some questions and, and hear what you what you both think about it okay, okay. thank you so much thank you, thank you. Right. Sorry, Eva. i unmute myself great and, uh, you're better you. than i am thank you very much for inviting me for inviting fondazione arte della seta Lisio, which is the institution i work for since many years we are uh, based in florence and we do weave textiles mostly silk by hand and the institution i have a presentation that perhaps can start now and the institution is being founded more than a hundred years ago by a man called giuseppe Belizio. and this man was living in the time when uh, historic revivals were the most hip thing to do. And so it was the time when Frederick Stribert was wearing original 
original textiles and original weapons from the, the late Renaissance and the early Renaissance. And when Giulio Franchetti was assembling his collection, which has been donated later to the, to the Museum del Bargello. So some of the institutions that have been starting to collect and study textiles in the very beginning of the 20th century. In the same cultural environment, Lisio, which is the man depicted on the right, uh, started his, his activity. He had a workshop with many people weaving mostly textiles with the historical inspiration. That means textile based on the medieval and Renaissance styles. He was also a collector of the very early textile studies. We have a copy in our archive of the of a little guide to the Musée Historique de Lyon. He was visiting and he was very aware of whatever was happening in the time. So he built his company little by little. He had a, a shop in the center of Florence, in the district where antique dealers are most active. And he decorated it with copies of the original pieces that in the same period of time were displayed in the Palazzo d'Avanzati, so to say. So a, a very, very charming environment. He was a, a supplier of the royal family, Italian royal family, and he had many connections. Some of the early fabrics he has made were inspired by the state, the present time, the time their publication. So he had a version of this uh, ancient piece, this Samitum, in, in his uh, lampasses and brocades. Same was happening with this fabric that was inspired by the Sancta Santorum collection. You see him translated the original Samitum, which is a very precious technique, into a brocade, again using metallic thread and silk. And this fabric has been used also later on, and it's a very, very historical interpretation. This is one of the first textiles also he made, uh, inspired by a fragment that he had bought, he had acquired in the antique market. Because in the time, it was very easy to find original artifacts from late medieval Renaissance, Baroque time. And he was assembling a collection of fabrics to be inspired either by the technique and the patterns. So he replicated this fabric 100% as it was. This is the, the fabric and this is the graph paper, the technical paper. In those years, that's more than 100 years ago, they were hand painted by gouache on, a, on ruled paper. Nowadays we work differently. One of the old pieces he had also is this piece of velvet that was quite common in the 17th century. It's a very simple, but yet very modern, so to speak, if you look at it, piece. And he reproduced it, here is it. And it's one of the fabrics we mostly make nowadays as well. This is the very tiny little graph paper of it. He replicated also the heraldic fabric of the Medici family, which has become our emblem. So to, you, you can see it here. You see, it's the same, the same image. And he also got inspired by the paintings of the collections of the Uffizi. So you can see this, this fabric inspired by Botticelli's uh, painting that was used in 2000. 2020 for an ex, uh, a catwalk event in the Palazzo uh, della Signoria in Florence in September by Dolce Gabbana. We have very many different activities besides from producing fabric. We take care of our, our um, heritage, that means the archives. We do produce uh, a magazine that publishes two numbers a year on textile studies and textile history. And we do produce fabrics. And we do educate younger people to the use and design of looms and fabrics in general. 
this, this is a page of our website. You can see here one of the looms. You see it's a totally man-powered uh, technology, totally made by hand. And you can see here a glimpse of our, the workshop where the students work. We have five looms and we have a student now in the other room working. I'm sitting here in the, uh, in the computer lab of the foundation. And it, this is the environment around us. We are on the outskirts of Florence. This is a brocading loom seen from, from above, from the top. And here we see some of the students working and some other students analyzing and cataloging ancient fabrics because we do also teach a hand on the knowledge of uh, how to interpret, describe, and eventually scientifically file an ancient fabric in order to reproduce it or simply to describe it for a catalog or for a historical study. We have been uh, um, commissioned very many different fabrics in the past as nowadays. This fabric here, this is the graph paper that was made during the 50s to reproduce this uh, brocaded fabric in the, for the Florentine diocese. It's, uh, you see, it's a very big, big pattern and it's Baroque pattern because later on uh, other styles have been, uh, have been studied and uh, recreated. This is a fabric that was commissioned by the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. And it's, it's a typical Florentine pattern that Lisio has produced since almost a hundred years. We still have, produce these fabrics nowadays for special commissions. This is a plain velvet commissioned by the Palazzo Madama Museum in Turin. It's a very special plain red velvet with a very green background to enhance the color, to give some vividness to the fabric. And we have been commissioned also 80 meters of this um, veluto a specchio, we call it, mirrors, mirror velvet, because it has a lamella background and it reflects light. This is a long project, has been uh, uh, a three years project we had to reproduce to produce the exact color of the original piece, reproduce the, the huge pattern and weave 80 meters of it. You have to, to remember that a piece of velvet is woven uh, in a rhythm of three to four days to the meter. So every Every day the weaver is producing 25 up to 30 centimeter on a daily basis. So it takes very, very many days and weeks and months and years to produce the fabric for this whole. And later we have produced also, this is a more recent project. This is ended last year for the um, August Die Starke uh, Museum in Dresden. And we had to produce this golden fabric, this cloth of gold and red velvet to be em embroidered one on top of the other. You see, when we get this type of, of commissions, the work starts with analyzing the yarn and reproducing the yarn perfectly. That means that the ancient fabric has been studied analytically and the, the suppliers have reproduced specifically for the order this very yarn. And the, the yarn have been colored also in the very specific color. So, but it's not only restoration what we do. We work and we have patterns that can fit also nowadays, nowadays state, tastes. And so this is a pattern that has been adapted from our archive some years ago for Bulgari. They needed to have some very graphic fabric for their handbags. And here is the original pattern had uh, some images were 15 centimeters and it's been reproduced half the size for this bag. And it's totally possible nowadays, instead of painting gouache, we um, scan it and have digital, digital media to reproduce fabrics. But 
and we have been commissioned very many different projects by Fendi over the years. This is the very first project. As you see, it's a handicrafted fabric that is then handicrafted, assembled by, by them. So, and we have made um, some 15 different patterns. To produce one of the patterns is a few months work because we have to digitize the images, produce the physical cards, and then weave on the looms. That means that a little bag like that can be four months of work altogether. And so, and for this very project, we produced two pieces for the fashion show, a little bit like Elif was saying. Now, this Artifacts are so costly, so extravagant that only a few pieces at the end are made. And but we have also some projects which are somehow crossing all, all times and ages. This is a piece from the archive that in the times of Lisio has been has been uh, traced and reproduced. This is a similar one. And you see, in the archive, the pieces sometimes are very, very old and very ruined. So this feel of a very ancient fabric that has survived over the centuries has been embodied in the newer version that Lisio made. So he reproduced the effect of worn out fabric into his, reproducing precisely the, the images here, into into newly reproduced fabrics and creating this brocade which is some of the best sellers of Lisio ever since it's more than 100 years since this fabric is produced and and you see it's named after this painting by Paolo Veronese we call it the Veronese brocade because it's on the dress of the figure of justice in here and it's been found some years ago visiting Malta there on this, on the background of this very important icon, there's a piece of fabric, which is ours. I could recognize precisely this man-made fading, you know, this man-made darnings in the fabric. And it's also been chosen by the the Queen of Denmark for a ceremonial dress. So it's a fabric that has a background, but it is also a fabric that can have a future life because some years ago, the background of it has been chosen to be, to be woven as a brocade here on this loom to be the fabric for a jewel bag by Cartier. You see, we have a loom here, which has a unique pattern. So we can have a, a pattern that, that doesn't repeat. And we could then program the loom so that the shape of the bag could fit precisely into, into the loom. This loom is computerized, so it's run by, a, by CAD. And we can program using CAD any type of, of pattern to be woven in, uh, in silk, in metallic yarns, but also in some cases we have produced fabrics with feathers, uh, raffia, linen, any kind of material, even pearls, eventually, eventually. And we have students even now that are studying to become designers in this field. Oh. Thank you, Eva. That was another very impressive uh, presentation. <laughs> so you, in the end, you're mentioning students again, and this is also what I wanted to ask you about because great part of the work you do, as you said, is uh, educational. So I'm quite curious to know like in a projection towards the future, what uh, can you uh, capture from your students? What are, what are their ideas on, on craft and the future of, of, uh, of craft work? How do you see it? I'm quite, quite old, so to say, because I've been working here 
teaching since 25 years, over 25 years. So I have met many, many students in the past. It used to be more uh, older people. Nowadays, we have plenty of young people and we have realized that young people, young generations are very interested in the, in the craft and in making with their hands. And so in this very last course, we are running now in these days with the Art Academy of Florence. We realize that students are more interested in anything um, mechanical or to be made by hand, really crafted rather than digital. Oh. Digital, some years ago, we had an uh, electrical background, um, breakdown. And one of the students were like, yeah, you turn off the computers. I keep weaving. <laughs> she really enjoyed, she was a girl from New York, she really enjoyed the fact that she didn't need anything of these new technologies to work. And mm -hmm. she's now become the, the prof in one of the universities, I think in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So she was here being quite a young person and she, she became, you know, she, she learned quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Here we have these programs that are, are either dedicated to universities and some specific programs, or we run also summer classes, summer courses mm -hmm. for a general, a general interest. That means a designer, a student, uh, and a textile enthusiast can come and learn how to design jacket. We do have also courses for simple weaving. We are running now in these days a, a small course in, um, in design and I had a day workshop with the students which are specializing in fashion design. And so I, I let them weave. And the other day I was going down and one of the girls said, well, this was the, f the most enjoyable day of our course. It's a 600 year, hours course. I mean, I was very happy because <laughs> Weaving was not perceived as something to do for a young person. It was a thing for the old ladies, for grandma. And mm. nowadays, very young people think that it's hip, that it's nice, it's something to do. And I'm very happy about that. That is very... Two weavers. two weavers are, in our team, we have five weavers. Two of them are less than 30 years old. One ah. is 21. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. That's very nice. That's some very encouraging <laughs> news you gave us here. That's really great, wonderful yeah. news. And as another question I, I wanted to ask both you and Elif um, as a final question. Um, so I would like to, it's, it's something that it's always on my mind, like to understand like cra the crafts how much um, are they still or are they again part of our daily life because in the work that both of you do um, we see a final output that is of course um, destined for a very high-end uh, public so of course these are extremely precious pieces and they, ha they have a very high value uh, according to the materials and the time that has been spent and the expertise but I would like to know in our everyday life where where does craft come in and um, how, oh, yeah what's the, what's the statement of, of the actual uh, time that we live in for for craft on a more daily basis do you have some thoughts about that well I think that people are interested in the crafts it, it is true that we have been flooded with low quality materials that were imported and they were handmade but they weren't very special and so i think that the makers have to make sure that the quality is good enough so that the public is perceiving handicrafted material as something special not mm -hmm. as something that it's less precise or less uh, less precious than something mechanically and perfectly reproduced mm -hmm. but you know mm -hmm. things change very quickly nowadays so what was true 10 years ago is no longer true now mm -hmm. there's more interest for the handicrafted 
material nowadays than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel I feel that too. Elif, what, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I think um, now we are living in an age that everything is so fast. We consume everything so quickly. So I think uh, the crafts or handmade things are getting more precious because of this, because they um, it takes so long to do them, and it's a kind of contradiction, no? Uh, but I think uh, it will be more important uh, in the future. And I think also uh, with the lockdown, uh, most of us found uh, out in themselves that they could do something. Before, maybe we didn't even have time to try something, but even a very basic thing. Now, I think the, um, uh, we are uh, finding out the tradition in another way. So maybe it's uh, getting important to give time to do something by ourselves as well. I don't know if it's clear or not. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's an anthropological, anthropological need of people. Yeah. You know, having the satisfaction of this wasn't existing, now it's it's real. I made it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can really relate to that as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. So uh, I'm glad because this casts like a very positive and optimistic um, light on the future of craft. So. Uh, thank you for 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 the inspiration you're giving us and and for the amazing work you do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Filippo, I pass the word back to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Arianna and uh, Elif and uh, Eva. I think that the experiences that you presented are amazing. So, but uh, let's go quickly to our second panel, the one coordinated and designed by uh, you, you, the University of, e of Evora and the uh, Passau Futuro Association. So our partners uh, based in Alentejo in Portugal. So uh, thank you and um, good afternoon, Fatima and to all the other speakers. I give the floor to you. Thank you, Filippo, and it's a pleasure to meet all of you remotely. I wish we were all together. Um, this is Musette Nielsen, so I would like nice to introduce her. Speaking to you. Um, I'm going to give a, a brief presentation about Paso Futuro. And can I? So we're an association that started in 2016 um, out of Lisbon, Portugal, and. Um, we started by mapping um, different crafts. The idea was to create a map of different crafts in Portugal and craftspeople that are practicing them in order to link them with um, designers and architects. Um, sorry, I'm just showing a presentation. And then through this beginning of mapping, we did a lot of interviews with artisans and we realized that there was a, sort of a deeper project that needed to happen which were initiatives to be designed that would help different artisans and also help um, attract a younger generation of craftspeople. So the pillars of our work um, is research and development, uh, activation, training and education, social innovation, awareness building, and sustainability. Um, so I'm going to show you quickly just a few of the projects that we've done. Um, this is the last residency of Applied Arts from Nature, where we worked with several different materials and um, five different designers came to work with five different artisans in Lole. And these are the, the final pieces. Um, and then I'm just gonna go quickly because we have two, we, I want to focus on the speakers. But just so you can see how the designers and artisans in the collaborative structures are reimagining the traditional crafts. This was the reimagined decorative arts residency where we were working specifically with decorative arts at the Fundação Ricardo Espírito Santo Silva. 
Um, again, it was four different designers uh, working within the 18 workshops at the foundation. So we focus on different materials and techniques that have utilitarian applications. So more on the design and architecture side and less on the fashion side. This was a plant-based design residency where we're working with natural fibers. Um, these were two different teams of uh, designers and artisans working together. Um, this was a chair and a lamp. And this was the farm to textile residency that we did last year in Mertola um, with Powered by People. And these are the pieces that resulted. And this was a ceramic residency with Vicara in Vienna de Valentejo, where we brought uh, four different graphic designers to work with the artisans on traditional pieces, but reinterpreting the motifs that they used in a more um, kind of urban and young graphic way. And this is an exhibition. So this is, um, those were sort of activation projects that we're working on. And this is an exhibition at the Popular Art Museum where we worked with the Ethnology Museum and the Popular Art Museum to um, research all of their collections. And we created, we curated this exhibition that is um, material and technique based. So you have a wall with all of the materials and then each basket has a code that shows the techniques and materials that are used in each piece. So it was a tool set, it is, it's still up a tool set for architects and designers, but also a sensibilization project um, and an invitation for um, people to understand natural materials and how they could be used in a sustainable and regenerative way. These are the results from the summer school um, with basketry that we did with the Michelangelo Foundation and the Ministry of Culture and several partners. And um, this project was is exhibited there also. So these are um, this is an example of one of the student the summer school projects that we do with students. Um, and here you can see the results from that summer school. The the theme was co-living and co-working. Well. And then this was the summer school from last year in Lole um, with metal. And it was five different artisans and uh, no, five different artisans and 10 students. And that was the same model we had for the, the basketry summer school. And these are the results. And this was really looking at metal and how it, ha how it can continue into the future as a piece instead of having to be recycled or upcycled. So what, what is continuity and respect for the material? And this is the mapping that we did um, for basketry in Portugal, where we went to interview and document, photograph and video um, 35 different living artisans. Um, thank you. So without further ado, how do I get out of here? Leave studio. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to invite, um, I would like to introduce um, Misette Nielsen. We are so happy to have her with us today. Um, Misette has, um, has done incredible work with textiles in Alentejo. Alentejo is one of the five main um, regions of Portugal. So um, I would like to ask you to introduce sort of your story. Well, I'm... Anyway, thank you for having me. And then I'm originally from Holland and live in Portugal since 61. Uh, at that time, uh, up till 74, which we had the revolution, I was in fashion at the model agency, production, etc. And then, of course, we had the revolution, so I had to change my life completely. Um, in 76, 77, um, I was told that there was a manufacturer of textile, of uh, special fabric, what they call mantas, uh, having a big, big problem and didn't know really how to continue because there was no marketing, people were older, etc. Um, before, just before that, I was involved in 
in, in textile contemporary tapestries. The group was called uh, Arvore, which then more or less declined and restarted again under the name three, there's quite think, three, four, five, and is still working very much in contemporary tapestries and having exhibitions. But because buying this factory or taking over this factory, which then is a different kind of loom, um, I had to anyway think, start, and try. The, <clears throat> the most incredible thing about this factory was is the, at the moment the only survivor import was hand looms, big hand looms, and having an incredible collection of old samples. Because the Alentejo weaving, which we call mantas, which basically is a bed cover, um, is well, it's done in, with patterns which are very Moorish uh, and have a great significance. In the beginning, they were only brown and white because the sheep are brown and white. And then in the beginning of the 1900s, they start coloring. So, um, and I must say, it was very interesting to hear Alfie speaking because um, in part, uh, I was invited by the Turkish government for the symposium, which was the most important about the patterns, the female patterns, the male patterns, the Uzbekistan, the Kazu, uh, anyway. So it was fantastic. And that I made my, uh, realize the importance of the, uh, introduction of certain tribes and patterns and because the area I live is very Morris as a big Morris inheritance it was uh, I came to the conclusion that, that really we have to preserve the patterns our looms are four pedal looms which are introduced by the Muslims in 1200 or something and we still cope in uh, use them the four pedal looms for shots and uh, we use 100% wool. The wool is merino, um, which is a sheep very important in Alentejo, which also came from North Africa. And so now we had a problem <coughs> because before it were blankets for the bed, the colorful ones and the brown and white ones, the, the natural color ones for shepherds and what we call panos de terre, I mean country works. Um, they by tradition weigh three kilos, three and a half kilos. And there's nothing you can do, they have to be the weight. Now we entered in the Euro European community, which made that Portugal for the first time imported duvets, so it's much lighter, much easier, and here we were stuck with, I had 50 weavers at that time, just before we entered in Europe, mostly men, and what to do now? Nobody buys uh, a blanket for a wedding, okay, so it's, it made me <clears throat> an incredible problem with so many good people because you can't put money in employment. And so we decided to make carpets rugs. So, of course, we had to change the color scheme because nobody wanted those bright color on the floors. So we, I, <clears throat> I used the old designs and instead of the seven colors, which is traditionally, we just put a ton sur ton, um, anyway, and adapted myself uh, quite some graphic designs. <coughs> I was very lucky to uh, have family were also a artist. A part of that had some very special clients who really got it like cancer, etc. They really said, okay, this should not, you know, this should not die out. Absolutely, we have to 
not help you, but I mean, we will market the project from your originally 100 years old blankets, 1,000 year old blankets to, uh, anyway, other objects. And it's been very, very successful, really. We um, had no, mostly was export, we had deposits in, um, in America, many in America, we work a lot with Scandinavian designers, Japanese, a uh, lot of Italians, which uh, is very nice because the sensitivity uh, between our Southern Europe and Scandinavia, of course, is completely different. Um, in the meanwhile, I've been researching more and more and did uh, a book about Mantis Alentejanus, which is called Art and Tradition. And now I have done one is um, known the origin, know to do, and recreate patterns, which uh, will be going, I suppose, in the next few months will be out. Just also because of people can with this guidebook, or whatever you want to call it, people can do it at home and try to, on a small loom, because now we have more and more people who want to work at home or invent something at home. So they have exactly how to put on the looms, how to use the paddles, uh, color schemes, and whatever. So anyway. Thank you so much. That's all right. And um, how do you see the, the relationship um, between sort of the preservation that you've been doing with tradition and Continuation. The, the continuation and and what stays and what changes and um, uh, Fatima, as you know me for a while, you know how much I fought, mm -hmm. and also for this tradition should be passing on. I mean, you're working with Matula, they also in tradition, and uh, um, it's very very important. It's yeah. very important for young people to use their mind and not push a button and be on the computer and things it comes out, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's hard, it's hard work, it's physical. And uh, while you had the factory, we had uh, quite some stagiaires, some people, but you know, when they want to be at the factory and learn, it's minimum nine months because, you know, mm -hmm. to set up and to do and the battle and get the rhythm and from in your head and your hands and your legs it takes a while. So I had quite um, from the Swedish textile uh, university, the Danish textile, France of the Belles Arts. We have had we have had uh, even a Spanish architect who was my client and was so interested. He said, "Well, I take nine months off and I go <laughs> my going in pencil." And uh, they're just uh, interesting. So I have it. Uh, it's not like your workshops, you know. If you really want to do this seriously, to go on, it's a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just buying wool. Yeah. And they're going. It's a yeah. life change. <laughs> yeah, it's changed a lot. I mean, it did change my life. <laughs> <laughs> do you have uh, Do you have um, younger people coming in to start weaving with you, or is it more people who want to change no, no, their no. lives? Or? You know, when uh, before we had this adventure entering in Europe, I mostly had men. Okay, I had the electric machine, a two from the old ones of the 1930s, which are monuments now, and of course then they. It made too much noise, or that was not weaving, so we had to get rid of those. Okay. Um, I had men, and it's very funny because in the Alentejo of 76, being a woman and being a foreigner wasn't very easy life, but still. <laughs> so, um, when we entered in Europe, <clears throat> the men went to work in the construction because being a weaver wasn't uh, so chic. You know, now they could do the construction was growing up and things like that. It was a bit of uh, like that. But on the contrary, uh, then I got a lot of women because working on the land, 
with the sun, the rain, the rain on the Saturdays and Sunday, suddenly they realized it wasn't too bad working for a woman in, a woman in the factory. So mm -hmm. that was okay. And this one. Uh, younger people at the moment, Fatima, is not that easy because mm -hmm. it's not computerized. Mm -hmm. You know, it's physical. I mean, mm -hmm. it comes like that and you have to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it mm -hmm. has hours. You have to produce. And um, it is not very easy. It's like that. At the moment, they passed on. They, uh, they have, uh, I wouldn't say middle-aged women, they have some who have, you know, recent divorce, they don't want to work in hotels or something, you know, so around 40. Mm -hmm. But I had we uh, have weavers and they still keep there for 30 years. They're Beautiful. really, you know, and you can say this, the patterns have numbers. So you say make a, a 306, but change the green and blue, you know, they all, they have that computer in the head. No, it's, uh, yeah. And how but many you, have, you know, you yeah. have been there. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. no, I know. But it's just interesting to see who's going on to weave as a for for their lives, you know. Yeah, and yeah. if if there are twenty year olds coming in and becoming weavers, or if it's more women than well, men for, who want to change. Well, for twenty years, I mean, the the women I had coming from uh, art school. Mm -hmm. Except they were 25 or 22, and they really some came back and they really make a career with it. That's great. Uh, you know, it's people. It's a con it's a continued job. I mean, you cannot uh, have a carpet half or a month a halfway in a pattern, and then say, well, you know, uh, I'm leaving. No. I mean, yeah. To invest in this is a long time. Mm -hmm. It's a long time. And then, of course, it's the problem you know, straight away wages. But for the next three months, four months, I haven't produced anything. So, and, you know, it's uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, this, uh, the, the schools, the former science professionals, they have tried and I've collaborated with them. But they don't give the stimulation to continue, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. okay, you can have a loom and you go and it's like knitting and you pass a tempo. It's not a pass a tempo, it's not. Anyway, it's the same what uh, your colleague said. It's yeah, not exactly. a pass a tempo. No, yeah, it's a life. Yeah. Exactly. It's a profession. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. a beautiful profession. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before it was only men because. The word is weaver. You don't have a weaver. You know, it's mm -hmm. a weaver. It used to be a very strong man, male job. <laughs> and some women in there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to introduce Elise, and then we'll yeah. talk with both of you together. Um, hello, Elise. Hi. Can you Hi. can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So this is Elite Bernardo. She started a, a beautiful project called Saber Fazer that works all over Portugal. Um, and I would like you to introduce your project and explain uh, sort of your work and then what you're doing also in Alentejo. Yeah, sure. It will be a pleasure. So um, thank you. Uh, so my name is Elise Bernardo, as Fatima already told you. So and uh, I have a, a project which, which is called Saber Fazer, which if you translate it to English is the know-how or, or savoir-faire in French, and it says it all. And uh, I started it uh, 11 years ago, so uh, uh, more than a decade, decade ago. And it's mainly a project about, uh, it's dedicated to research and education on the small scale uh, manufacturing area, okay? Uh, not just textiles, but we are mainly focused on textiles. Uh, so when I started it 11 years ago, actually I was working with textiles, but not anything related to what was Fazer nowadays. I was actually uh, making and selling my own my own uh, accessories, and uh, but also I had worked as an architect because I'm trained as an architect. I had worked on documenting uh, certain manufacturing techniques, more related to to building construction, of course, 
and um, I guess both both of these interests came, came together uh, because I was really the more I was uh, making my own pieces, I became more and more interested about the origin of the materials that I was using, uh, and of course uh, because my personal interests, my my passion is also how things are made and how they happen to to materialize in our in our world. So this project started 11 years ago, very slowly. At first, more uh, on a documenting perspective, I think, because it's, it was kind of understanding what the landscape was in Portugal, which is quite different today, actually, uh, of when I started. Um, it was more understanding how, who was making what, how it was made, just kind of feeling, feeling the, uh, the area to understand a little bit about this. But this was, many years ago uh, after a few years from that it it started to focus uh, hardly uh, uh, on uh, education so it is what it is that's what it is today that's what we do we do education uh, we are a private project that sets us a little a little bit apart which is not very usual to find a private project to do the kind of education that we do um, since we are doing education and research, we, we decided to focus uh, on the textile area, uh, which, which is a personal preference, of course, but the day only has 24 hours, so you cannot possibly research and do all the areas uh, uh, with depthness, right? Uh, it would be very superficial, so we, we had to make a choice. That choice was to, to focus on the textile and go deeper and deeper. So um, the, the difference about how we do how we do the educational work, the, first of all, being a private company, we are doing it for the general audience. OK, so this for us is very important because we are educating on a whole spectrum. We, we, we have a very large uh, wide spectrum of, of uh, types of people that come into our space or into our events, wherever they take place. Uh, to learn with us, which is amazing. So one of the things that I think sets, a, sets us apart is that we uh, have the research as a routine. We are always researching, always producing knowledge, always producing content um, in, in, the main, in the main natural uh, fiber areas. Not just, we are not just talking about the weaving, in this case, as uh, we have been talking about, or the, the processing of it, but also the production of the raw matter, okay? So this touches in subject, subjects like uh, local resources or not so local, the origin of uh, matters you cannot weave if you, don't, if you don't have the raw matter. So everything will start in the sheep or in the fields or uh, in the silkworm, wherever you want. Uh, so our work starts, uh, uh, one of our practices is to have research as a continuous uh, practice here. So we are always researching. And this research is um, a combination of, uh, of researchers, let's, let's say it. So for one, we want to understand who are the people that are working and how they are doing it, both not just in the traditional, let's say, it, practices, but, but mainly how it is well made. So we, actually, we are interested in excellence, in saber fazer, in the savoir faire. So not so much how it is traditionally made, but how it is well manufactured, how it is well made. And if the, the local knowledge um, actually possesses something interesting or not, we have, we have found both things, that it is not interesting and that it is very interesting in, in a, a lot of fields. So um, our, our research is based on real practices. We do not do theoretical work. So when we research, we are talking about uh, growing flax, sh shear, uh, sheep shearing, uh, raising the silkworms, working, working to learn with the people that know how to do it, and also cross this knowledge with what is happening outside our country. So we are not only focused on traditional knowledge, we are focused on uh, crossing uh, different types of knowledges so that we can actually have a, a, a good output. And also, we want to make sure that this is a real practice in the real world, not, not in the real world, not a theoretical uh, thing. Um, 
uh, one thing that I think, which is, is it's very hard, but I think that really sets our work apart is the production of raw matter. Okay. So in our, in our, all our educational work, uh, when we teach, we are going to grow the raw matter, okay, the materials, or mm -hmm. are going to go get them to, through the shearing. Uh, in this case, you are seeing uh, the first flax field that we grew at Fundação Sal, which is one of the biggest contemporary art museums in Portugal. So at one time in Sal, uh, this will happen again, uh, but uh, during four years, in Schalf was producing flax, silk, and wool because they have uh, they have uh, fifteen uh, sheep of a local breed, and so we also organize the shearing and we process everything in situ. So all the learning moments in Schalf, for example, were based on locally, and I mean locally <laughs> in the same spot, produced raw matter. Um, and everybody was learning with what we were producing, which I think is uh, quite interesting because it gives you a, a real, uh, a real knowledge of how things are processed and transformed, not so theoretical. Okay. Uh, apart from the raw matters, the fibers, the natural fibers, we also started uh, growing natural dyeing plants. One of them is, uh, this is Persicari Tintoris, the Japanese indigo, but also other varieties of indigo. Uh, we, we extract indigo, we teach how to dye with it. Everything is based on practice. In this picture, for example, you can see this was um, grow in a, in a partnership with an organic farm here in Porto. So uh, we have uh, hundreds of square meters of indigo growing in Porto and, uh, and for our workshops, our courses, our students get to extract the indigo in the moment, which is something exceptional. We did it not just in our courses in Porto, but at uh, Funda Sand Orient in Lisbon as well, where we took the plants there and everybody was able to see in the moment and, and do it, to extract indigo and die with it. So we're always based on real practices, not theory. Um, and this goes on, not just, not just, it's not just in our work, our team that works with us, but also when teaching, okay? So we, we learn first and then we are teaching them uh, in the practice, all, always uh, hands in the dough, as they say in Portuguese, mauna massa which is everybody, the, the theory usually comes after you put the, your, your hands in the matter. Uh, in this case, you're seeing uh, silk reeling, okay, silk extraction from cocoons. This was in a museum in a uh, family cow. Uh, he, here you are seeing images of a three month long uh, flax growing course that we teach. We did not teach it during these two pandemic years, but we'll return uh, next year, luckily. But this is a three months course to teach how to grow flax. You, you, you uh, grow and process it into, into yarn. Um, and this includes, of course, visits to, to the visits and the contacts with people that are actually doing it as a life, uh, a life occupation, not a hobby. Uh, and this contact is very important, not just knowing how to do, but also understand the social part and the economical part and the sustainable, uh, the socially sustainable part, if it is or not, of, uh, of doing this. Those looms, everything goes, basket makers to teach, teach en masse, as we say, uh, mass teaching events, as we <laughs> like to say it. Uh, this is also in Schalves, where they have an event with thousands of people and... Uh, I think here we might we might have kind of a of a record on teaching people how to hand spin and weaving and make baskets because it's uh, it's crazy how many people just go through our 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 places. Uh, also in schools, always teaching, uh, not in theory in theory how things are made, but in practical. In this case, this was a. In a primary school, third grade, where these kids they grew and processed their flax uh, from seed to to um, to yarn, and in the in the final uh, in in the summer they have this event where they actually wove the the flax that they grew and spun, which is qu quite special. Um, 
So the, the ne next thing that we do in education is the development of content, contents, of course, because we do a lot of research, independent research, which makes us very agile. So we are very quick to respond to the, to the needs that we see. The, if we see that something is not being taught uh, or not being researched, we are very independent to take action on that. For example, this is uh, the only study, the first and only study, study that exists on Portuguese wool breeds and the wool that they produce. We, for this, it, this was done in 2015. For this, we collected wool from all the 16 breeds and processed them, uh, all the samples, so that you can get a real feel of the textile potential that they have. This was this was done to to. Uh, for us to learn, but also uh, to teach courses on this so that people can actually see for each breed, each local breed of where they are, what kind of uh, potential they, they, they have for, for textile use. Um, one of our staples is having the, our handbooks. We have uh, more than a dozen of, of uh, handbooks produced by us that accompany all our teaching moments. This is actually one of the, our portfolio, or this is the most important thing, the more valuable thing I think that we have here because these are years and years or decades of knowledge that are here. We are just now, up until now, we were just making this to give away in our courses and workshops. Right now we are starting to publish them so they will be available to the greater audience just if they don't have the possibility to come and learn with us, they can at least have the books. And here you have very specific knowledge. It's very hard to find on uh, uh, flax growing, weaving, indigo dyeing and producing, natural dyeing, basketry, a lot of themes that we explore. Um, the, just last year, we also started to, to grow, it was, this is was the first course, to grow our online platform with online courses um, that uh, that give the possibility for, to, to anyone that is far away from us uh, because we are located in Porto. So we have a lot of followers from other countries that can take these courses uh, with all the contents, more contents even that we usually are able to give in our presential courses. Uh, and one of uh, our... our um, Specialties, I think, is technical knowledge. We are not so focused on tradition per se, but on how things are well made in small scale. So this is, this is our actually our two focus. Okay, small scale uh, up to to the middle scale, uh, and uh, quality of production. And for and for this technical knowledge, savoir faire is uh, you, you cannot go. You cannot have it. You cannot go around. Um, and so one of the one of the things that we are uh, this is one of the machine that we developed because we had a problem to solve with flax sketching that in Portugal is done by hand and uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, profitable it's not so we built we just built the machine and solved the problem so we also develop uh, technology when we, when we need it um, but one thing that is very important for us is communication okay because we are we, we are teaching not to a specific audience, like in an university or in a closed setting or more closed setting, but to the general audience. So um, usually we are, we, are, we are present in the social media platforms, we have newsletters, we have everything online. So that this, act, this type of information and it, this type of uh, knowledge, uh, in this case related to the textile, small scale manufacturing, can actually become more, more commercial, okay? More accessible and more, uh, uh, has, have more appeal to a younger audience, which is important if we are focused on uh, making the transition and making a renovation just like Mizet was talking about, what we need to for the next generation or the, the ones that are coming uh, to, 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 to take this and keep doing it, okay? And not give up because it's not sustainable. So I think communication is a big part, but mm -hmm. also the renovation uh, of image of this area uh, 
So one thing that we think about, we are always thinking about when we are communicating and working and producing something is how is this sustainable in the 21st century? Okay, so this is a topic that we work in general. Thank you for uh, having me, <laughs> Fatima. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm really happy to have both of you together because I think you are tackling this continuity of knowledge in, in very interesting ways that are um, complement each other. I think so. so. I think <laughs> yeah. so. So, um, and, and how important it is for us to look, um, to be working on all these levels um, for the continuity of the Sabir Fazer that, um, that is sustainable and that can, can actually yes. help us in the 21st century. Okay, so. but not only Sabir Fazer is the main protege, mm -hmm. they protected our incredible culture inheritance mm -hmm. in Texas. Yeah. You know, and as uh, as you know, we are nearly ready with the project, the camera from the gangs and also us because of the UNESCO. Mm -hmm. So the investigation has been over 600 pages and more, I mean, you know, since 1100 mm -hmm. and before that, there are documents that we all were weaving. So it's so important that we. Just don't uh, get the Chinese, I mean, good for them, they weave beautiful hand weaving, but you know, that really to be conscious what is ours, where it came from, uh, how to preserve it, and think of the, um, I don't know, the, the energy that's put in it, even if you buy a little like that, or with her, a little mm -hmm. bit of that, with the textile of from the ones we have just seen it's so important to remember to it and to respect mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. it's not just a piece of cloth it's not just an old piece of the mask where it came from how it was preserved what's behind it and each piece has a story that's what i think do you agree completely okay. and i think um, at least i wanted to ask you um, with the work that you're doing and the workshops that you're doing, that's helping people to understand the textiles in their lives, you know? So how, what's the reaction that you're seeing from people after they do their workshops in relationship to the textiles in their, that they wear or the textiles that they have in their homes? And uh, also the, the reaction, the reaction is very, it changes them, it changes them a lot, okay? Because... <laughs> Uh, usually they come here uh, through the most uh, aesthetically ap ap uh, appealing uh, techniques like weaving or natural dyeing, okay? Mm -hmm. But after mm -hmm. they are here, they start looking at the materials. We, we only use uh, natural fibers. Uh, mm -hmm. They start looking at, okay, but what is this? Oh, this is flax. But, but how, how does it become, yeah, no, this is another workshop. And then they, it's kind of, they, they start doing all the courses <laughs> and mm -hmm. the transformation. I used to say, okay, the transformation we, we, we lure, lure them in, you know, and then uh, we don't let them go until they finish <laughs> the whole set. <laughs> and the thing is, it changes them a lot because there's a, it changes completely the perception of everything, not just of time, okay, the time that things take to get made, okay, because uh, the general perception is that it is very fast, where it is not. Even in the mm -hmm. industry, it is not fast, people, okay? The chain of value in the industry is very, very long, just people think that the things appear in the shops or in the fabric shop or, or, or the yarn just appears and we can weave with it. No, it takes, it's a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. For example, in the flax course, which is the longest that we te teach, these are three months, okay, growing flax. It's like the change is like night to day because they start we, we, the, at the first session. You are only going to sow the plants, so you leave and you don't have anything. And people are so now what? Now you're going home and pray that everything germinates and that you have flax. Right. Maybe in three months. Right. Maybe in three months. But in the end, for example, one ex one uh, specific example of one of these courses that I taught. Uh, in the end, we have this, this, the last class is about sketching the flax, the flax, combing the flax and spinning it, okay? And we are not talking, I, uh, we are not talking about store-bought flax, okay? Mm -hmm. So yeah. they are 
this this uh, 25 people are either going to spend my personal flex, which is not going to happen, or they are going to spend the one they grow, which is what happens. That's why you have to grow it because you're not going to spend mine. And uh, but when I'm going to teach them to spin wool, to spin uh, yarn, sorry. Of course, you are learning, you are going to ruin a lot of fiber. This is only natural, of course. You're not immediately going to start to hand spin. This is usually what I teach. So they had two possibilities. I took some, some industrial wool with me, so industrially processed Portuguese mm -hmm. wool with me. And uh, they had their own flax. And I was like, okay, so now we need to, to, to learn how to spin. What do you prefer? Your own flax that took you three months to grow? Or this wool <laughs> that I bought and everybody went, I'm not going to spend my flax on, on mistakes. You know, yeah. they went for the wool. So these three months gave them the, the, um, the vision, you know, and the understanding of the real efforts that go right. into processing things. So, mm -hmm. and this happens in all our courses, you know, it's not even in the weaving courses, uh, everybody's like, uh, Oh, so much time to, to weave the warp and set the loom. Yes, but there's no way ar around it. And this is, a part, this is a part of our AVN here at Saber Fazir. There are no shortcuts. I'm not going to give you my, my flex just to play around a little bit. You are going yeah. to grow your own <laughs> and do yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, with the residencies that we're doing, we have passports for the pieces where we break down every single step that goes in from the shearing of the sheep down to the final piece. And a blanket takes 100. If you do everything by hand, it's 175 hours. Oh, <laughs> so, I, um, and I wanted to say also these books um, from Misette, we'll send the links to everybody for this book so that you can see more of her work. Um, because uh, these are basically on the old patterns, uh, absolutely uh, with the old patterns. I mean, the registration of those patterns are more or less beginning 1900, 1890, etc. So there and they, as you know, I sold the factory, I passed it over to three people who were very enthusiastic and they continue. Of course, they have their own uh, vision of the color schemes, etc. but they keep traditionally also with the designs. Of course, if you buy something new, a new adventure, you want to put everything in your, your color schemes and designs, but you don't, yeah. Have you ever been to the factory, Alice? Not yeah. yet, Mila, not yet. Okay, so we'll have a, a, the next meeting there. Should we open up to all, everybody from Italy also, so that we could all um, speak together? Hi. Hi. Hello. Oh, somebody asked about the title of the book. It's called Mantash Alentijanas Arquitridusan. And there's a. Um, you want to translate? This is the area on Dezu. Mantas is Mantas where cover has cover. Art and tradition. That's all. Yeah, art and tradition. And this is the. This is the factory. That's more of a manufacturer. manufacturer. It's a manufacturer, it's not a factory. And Mizette's working on a new book now, but that's going to be coming out soon. <laughs> um, so it's so nice to meet all of you. To see Thank all you very much. Thank you very much, Fatima and Alice and Mizette. I think that the, the experiences that you presented are so interesting and they are matching so uh, perfectly with the ones uh, that we selected uh, in our area. I don't know if there are some questions or comments to what have been, uh, let's say, presented until now. We are very, very happy for the quality of the intervention, of the speeches, of the experiences that you are presenting. Uh, I really hope that there will be in the future possibility of uh, ex exchanging uh, other experiences and setting up collaboration among all these 
-hmm. fantastic uh, realities and companies and, and activities. So maybe in the future, we will find other ways to set up collaboration among yeah. This would be sure. great. We will come and visit you. We'll come. We're yes, especially, especially want to visit and. See. We are really we are really coming. Yeah. We are coming together with the, our staff is coming to in the second part of uh, May. We are setting up a study visit, uh, so I really hope that there will be the possibility to visit uh, either Mizet and Alice when we are coming to Ebora. Uh, so we are organizing it with uh, um, with our uh, with Evora University, and uh, so uh, I don't know if there are some other questions or questions coming from from the from the social media. I have or... a question. Can I, I have a question for Elif actually? Hi, how are you? Um, I, I was wondering um, when you were speaking about your archive and how designers came to work with you and then you helped them with the making of the pieces, does that mean you have sort of um, a big network of craftspeople that are working with you or is it in-house? Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, some of them in the house. We do the samples here in Italy and I have two teams. Uh, one is in Turkey, one is in Tiran, Albania. Okay. Nice. And then the designers go and meet with them or they design with you and then... No, they only design with me. Okay. So interesting. Maybe we can also collaborate together. I would that like to would come and visit to... you. You're yes. always welcome to show, see my archive as well, whenever you want. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll be coming to Prato, so that would be lovely. Yeah. And hopefully Mizat will come too, maybe Elise. And Elif, my most fantastic experience was a symposium in the south of Turkey with weavers, with all experts in design. You know, it was amazing. Every morning was, fortunately, they were in, spoke German because, you know, me and Turkey is not very well. And it was amazing. We went around to the weavers, and funny enough, your weavers in the south of Turkey, mm -hmm. don't ask me where exactly, were exactly doing the same that my weavers were doing. The only difference was when I took pictures, that they didn't wear uh, shoes, and mine do. Now they do because <laughs> in the summer we weave either. So. so it was very funny. When I took these pictures with the same work, and they would say, well, what are you doing there? I mean, we do the same with the universe. Yeah. Yes, look at the feet. You don't do the same. So it was an incredible experience. After that, I was in Uzbekistan and Ethiopia for Texta. But your symposium, I want to go back one day. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to remember that on next June, the 22nd and the 23rd of June, uh, the final uh, conference of the Creative Wear Plus project is going to take place in Prato. So you are all invited to join this uh, physical, uh, physical yep. meeting. Yeah. And uh, I think that it would be a very interesting opportunity mm -hmm. to meet uh, by real. And uh, of course, Fatima, Fa Fatima or, of course, will join the, the meeting together with the colleagues from Evora. And uh, we are planning also to exhibit some of the uh, artworks and uh, or items that the, the, the laboratories there in uh, Alentejo are uh, developing within the creative um, uh, activities that uh, Passau Futuro is, uh, is organizing there. Uh, so this is a good opportunity. Okay, I don't know if there are other questions or... Um, I, I have a question also for... Um... Sorry, is something happening? Is everything yes, there is, a, there is a question coming from the, 
social media. Okay. Is there really a new generation of designers interested in recovering sustainable know-how in mixing tradition, creativity, and knowledge of traditions? Since you are all involved in education and training as well, what are the signs in this respect? This is a question that comes from the people who are following us. Is there Ab someone who wants to? I think all presentations were about that. Yeah. I think we have explained. I can give an example from the last metal summer school, actually, because we were working with metal, which isn't notoriously so sustainable um, due to mining um, and then waste. So we we worked with all the students on cradle to cradle principles and we worked with them on watching videos of mining and understanding really where their materials came from and how they were processed and how they could design with such a material and think about it for the future. And these were 20, you know, students in their 20s and they were so, so, so receptive. I was really amazed by the questions that they asked, by how they thought of, of they, they thought so sensitively to this topic. So I think that um, there is this younger generation right now is really, really attentive to sustainability. They're also really attentive to not wanting to be 100% technology. Um, so I think all of you probably agree, but there is this, um, under this desire to understand process and to understand where their things come from and to understand how they can relate to the world in a better way even though they're having waves and waves of information and a lot of them have a lot of anxiety about it there still is this this sense of of like hunger for knowledge and hunger for a new way yeah i agree because i all the time say you know uh, i've gone through a lot Gen I wouldn't say generation, a lot of young people and have been following me. And I really say at this moment, uh, this is a generation that really changed the chip. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because of COVID that they're home and think better, uh, but in my area and having uh, grandchildren and children myself, I feel that they're more conscious of what's happening around and I always joke and say, I have you change your chip, but about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really, I think, I think there's uh, a big movement of changing and being more interesting and hoping that they put a bit their mobiles and computers inside and use a bit more. But I think I've seen it a different. I think between the COVID before and those two years, and now I have seen a lot of movement or change, more conscience about the environment, more conscience about what's made by hand, more conscience, oh, this has been done by our grandmothers. Hello, they did that, you know, these kind of things. I think so. I hope so. At least you work on it, that they do. <laughs> Thank you, Misette. No, no. Hope to <laughs> So when you come to Portugal, all of you would be nice. If not, we go to it. We go to it. <laughs> Look at the comment. I would love to come to take part in one of the courses and either at Saper Fazer or, or in the summer classes you teach. So I definitely wrote that on my wish list. I would like it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Alice. Are your online uh, courses only in uh, Portuguese or do, do they uh, do you do them also in English? Uh, the videos, uh, they are spoken in Portuguese, but they are subtitled in Portuguese and in English as well, because uh, we have not yet translated uh, all of the, the written contents because it's a mix. The course is mixed content. OK, so you have videos for all the processes which are uh, uh, exemplified by the the teacher okay in this case the one that you saw was natural dyeing but there is also complementary material material 
uh, reading material, PDFs that you can download. This is all, for now, this is only in Portuguese. So we're focused for now uh, in, in serving the Portuguese speaking audience, which is underserved uh, in terms of technical information worldwide. Most of the good quality is in English, so this is a problem. Uh, but the videos are both uh, translated in both languages. Translated, I mean subtitled, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. it's quite, we, we have uh, students from other other languages doing the course and they can understand it perfectly okay. and no problem. Are you going to translate the books as well in English? Uh, the thing is you need to, you need to remember that we are self-funded, right? So everything <laughs> moves very, very slowly. Slowly. <laughs> so no. research. Research is our the pit, the endless pit where all the money goes, and sometimes a book and then... comes out. <laughs> okay, so now we are focused uh, in in making them in Portuguese. But for example, I can give you an example of a small. It's a very very little book, more like a flyer that we are launching maybe next week or we can have, which is a dictionary, a glossary dictionary of the weaving terms in Portuguese in English. Why? Because we have a lot of ah. Portuguese people learning in English because the English books are very, very good. Okay, they are very organized. The technical part is very good. And then they cannot make the connection with the Portuguese language mm -hmm. and the, even the traditional terms and not so traditional terms. So uh, we are actually making a bridge, you know, for different languages. So the, 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 uh, we are not so focused in what's happening in Portugal, but of course, but in connecting all of this that is happening in the world in small scale manufacturing. Okay, but we cannot translate everything yet. <laughs> <Of course>. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, for translations, okay. there are some funds available also, mm. thanks to some European uh, programs. Right, so thank you. Thank you, Filippo. With, within, yes. the, within the um, Creative Europe program, there are some specific strands addressed mm -hmm. to tra translating translate. different languages in several lang different languages. Uh, text. Yeah, thank you. So That's on. very useful so, to know. Thank you so much. Yes. Anyway, uh, I I don't think that we can draw. Uh, I would I would not like to draw uh, conclusions of this very very interesting meeting. I think that we we really reached the target of making a connection uh, between the two territories among all these interesting uh, subjects that are working so well in this very interesting sector, the textile and crossing sector. Uh, just very few comments. Uh, I think that uh, we can assume that there is a future for European textile craft craftsmanship. Uh, the problem is how to better transmit these skills uh, for the future. And we, uh, we already know that uh, at least some of your um, entities are very working very well on this uh, sector. And uh, we think that there is a, a place for making things and by hands, and there is a market and a space for uh, the uh, quality products made by hands. Um, uh, it's very important that we realize that many traditional text techniques are still alive and uh, in use for either for business purposes and also for education. And uh, education is a very interesting business that goes in parallel with production for most of your uh, entities. So this is a very positive aspect. And uh, I, uh, it's, it's a very important to underline that youngs and uh, also general public are uh, demonstrated uh, their um, strong interest uh, in this kind of activities. Uh, somewhere, some, some, somewhere uh, more, somewhere less, like Mizet was uh, underlining. Anyway, heritage, I think, it uh, seems to be crucial and uh, represents an important added, added value for this uh, sector. 
And it seems that uh, we can confirm that it's a very important resource for the future of the sector. So it's, uh, this is a very important aspect also for us as a museum. Mm. Uh, it seems that Savoir Fair uh, has a future and uh, it has a market as well. So this is also another important aspect that comes out from the discussion. And also that time is so important for the chain value and for the value of the products that you are you work on, you produce. And I think that uh, sustainability is at the very center of all the activities that you are presenting uh, today. I would conclude by saying that uh, projects like European projects and public funds should uh, be more and more addressed to support and to enhance this kind of experiences and uh, also the education and training activities that you are carrying on, which are so important to, to transmit the, the, this kind of knowledge. So uh, thank you again to all of you. We really hope to see you either in Portugal or in Prato during the final conference in June. So stay, stay in contact with the project and with us through the social media channels, the website, and so on. And uh, thank you again also to all the people that attended the, this very interesting seminar. So thank you again, and I hope to see you, you very soon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I thought we were going to have more time to talk.